the mind feeds on its moods and its objects. So we've got to find something good for it to feed on. We have the choice. And there are all kinds of things that you could focus on right now. And so it's up to you to choose the right place to focus, the right place to feed. And so you look around in the body. Where is a comfortable place? Where is a spot where you can watch the breath clearly and comfortably? And then try to stay in touch with that place and stay in touch with that sense of comfort as well. You find that watching it after a while that certain ways of breathing give rise to a feeling tone that feels good, that feels healing. And so you try to maintain that feeling tone, which may mean that you have to adjust the breath after a while. Because the knees of the body, as the mind begins to settle down, begin to change. The breath can grow more and more still, more and more refined. The less your mind jumps around thinking about this, thinking about that, the less oxygen you need. So allow the rhythm to change as is necessary. But the important thing is learning to ride that feeling tone. It's like riding a wave with a surfboard. Getting a sense of when to lean a little to the left, a little to the right. Steer here, steer there. To maintain your sense of balance. And at this point, whatever other issues may come up, remember you're choosing to feed right here. You don't have to feed on other things. There may be a little voice in your mind saying, look at that, watch this. Are you going to worry about that, worry about this? Just keep reminding yourself, no, not right now. Because an important principle in the practice is getting a good, strong foundation. So you can feel secure in the present moment that no matter what happens, you've got a place where you're, you're safe. And as you feed there more and more often, you find the mind does get stronger. When it gets a sense of nourishment from and the sense of inner comfort that you get, you can spread it around so the comfort gets more encompassing. And you find there's parts of the body you can't spread it to. Okay, well just we don't have to focus there yet. Focus on the areas where you can spread that sense of comfort. Allow yourself to be bathed by it, surrounded by it. So the mind has more and more good food to feed on. As it gets stronger, it can be again to look at those other areas that are more problem areas. Because it doesn't have to feed on them. This is why pain, say, for example, is such a big problem, because we find ourselves feeding on it. It's like you have a good kitchen where there's lots of good food stocked up, but you go out and you go rooting around in the garbage pail. To get the mind well fed with a sense of ease, a sense of well-being. And then when you turn to look at the pain, you, you see it in a different way. When you look at something as food, as something that you can get some sort of sustenance out of, you're going to see it in one way. Because immediately the pain is disappointing. It's not very good food. And yet when the mind is hungry, it just feeds on whatever it can find. But when it's not hungry, you can look at it and say, oh, that's, let's look into this. What is this? And your whole attitude towards it is very different. Remember the Buddha said, try to comprehend pain. He doesn't say snuff it out. And one way of comprehending it is to see okay, how much you can use the breath to deal with the pain how much your different attitudes towards the pain will change the way you experience the pain. You experiment around the pain to see what happens, in particular to get a sense of the difference between the physical pain and the mental pain. The Buddha talks about people being shot by arrows. He says the physical pain is like being shot with one arrow, and then on top of that you shoot yourself with another arrow. In other words, the physical anguish or 
sense of being upset by the pain. That's totally optional. And when you've got a body, you've got to admit there's going to be pains. Even the Buddha had pains after his awakening. But the difference was he knew how not to shoot himself with arrows, with those unnecessary second arrows. And it turns out that those are the ones that really hurt. Those are the ones that cause the problem. So but you just can't go marching in and saying, okay, you, out, stop. You've got to learn to say, okay, where is the dividing line between the physical pain and the mental pain? And you do that by experimenting with the breath, experimenting with the labels you put on the pain, asking yourself questions about the pain. What shape does the pain have? And you find that the mind gives it a shape. Okay, what happens when you don't give it a shape? How does the pain move around? Is it moving around on its own, or is it moving around because you're pushing it around? These are things you have to learn how to experiment. It's only through the experimentation that you, things begin to divide out on their, on their own. In other words, if you go in with preconceived notions that the dividing line has to be here, or there, it turns out that that's not the case at all. You're forcing your ignorance on the pain, which of course just makes it worse. What you've got to do is learn how to experiment. Okay, how do you change? How do changes in the breathing change the pain? How do changes in your concept of the breath change the pain? How do changes in your concept of how the mind relates to the body? Is the mind in the body? Is the body in the mind? Where in the body is the mind? It may seem like silly questions, but you begin to realize well, the mind actually does think in those terms. basic assumptions of where the center of our awareness is, and where the pain is in relation to that center, and how it affects that center. These play a really important role in how we experience the pain, and how we make ourselves suffer unnecessarily from it. So in a lot of ways you can experiment and test things. But the important point is you've got to get the mind settled down with that sense of well-being first. Because otherwise it's going to be sneaking little bites of the pain, feeding on the pain, and then not liking the food. And that just makes things, that just really complicates the issue, makes it impossible to analyze things out. And gaining this foundation, gaining this sense of well-being, that, that takes time. You've got to be patient with it. Keep working at it again and again and again. You can't say, well, I've done this X number of days or X number of weeks or X number of years. I should be beyond that. You keep working at it as long as it's necessary. Because the concentration is the part of the meditation you can do. And the asking of the questions is something you can do, but the insights that actually give you that awe. You can't do those. Those come as a result of the other actions. But it's not something you can intend. You can intend to get the mind to settle down. You can intend to learn how to ask those questions. But when the results come, okay, that's, that's something you can't determine in advance. Just make sure you've got the causes right in terms of the stability of your gaze, the sense of well-being that you can fall back on whenever you need it, and that quality of appropriate attention, learning how to ask the right questions. That's what you do in the meditation. That's what you intend in the meditation. things fall together just right, okay, then the results will come. And be able to ferret out the difference between that, say, the physical pain, or the pains of the condas, pains of the aggregates, as opposed to the pain of attachment and craving and clinging. 
moment you can see that distinction, and it's, you see it in the doing. You catch yourself in the doing and seeing how the doing affects this and affects that. It's not something you can sort of figure out in advance. But when the distinction becomes clearer in the doing, okay, then you've, you've cut the mind away from those attachments and cravings. And the Buddha said that his job was done. That's what he meant. There were still pains in the bodies. There were still issues in life. But the mind no longer had to suffer because of them. That's where awakening makes you know, a permanent difference. We hear over and over again about impermanence, impermanence, impermanence. We're even told that awakening is an impermanent thing. But it is possible to make permanent changes in the mind. The image they have in the text is of a carcass of a cow. They take off the skin, sort of cutting all the little tendons and all the little connection, connecting tissue. And then no matter how much you put the skin back on the cow, it's never connected in the same way. It's right there, but there are no connections because the knife of discernment has cut them once and for all. <coughs> 